Head injuries always cause total memory loss, like in movies. Hollywood loves the dramatic amnesia scene. A character wakes up in a hospital bed, stares blankly at their spouse and asks, who are you? They've forgotten their name, their family, their entire existence. Makes for great drama, but it's almost never how real brain injuries work. Your brain stores memories like a giant web spread across different areas. Old memories get really deeply wired in, so they're tough to wipe out. Most head injuries mess with your ability to make new memories or maybe erase some recent stuff from right before the accident. This happens because there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus that's like your memory maker, and it gets damaged easily. But all those established memories scattered throughout your brain, they usually stay put. Total memory wipe where you forget everything? That's super rare and means your brain got really, really, really damaged in multiple places. Everyone learns best according to their learning style. You've probably been told you're a visual learner or an auditory learner. Schools love sorting kids into these categories and tailoring lessons to match. Sounds logical, right? Problem is, there's zero evidence this actually works. Scientists have tested this learning styles thing over and over, and it never works. Students don't perform better when lessons match their supposed style. What your brain actually needs is challenge and variety. Mixing things up forces your brain to work harder and remember better. Think of it like this. Your brain has different areas that handle words and pictures. When you read about how rain forms while looking at a diagram, both areas team up and create stronger memories with more ways to remember stuff later. The best learning happens when you use multiple senses together, not when you stick to just one preferred style. After age 25, your brain stops developing. This one gets thrown around a lot, especially when talking about why young adults make questionable decisions. Yes, the front part of your brain responsible for decision-making and impulse control finishes developing around 25, but that doesn't mean your brain just stops growing. The front part of your brain is the last area to get fully insulated. That's when nerve pathways get wrapped in fatty stuff that makes signals travel faster. But your brain's ability to rewire itself and form new connections continues your whole life. This happens because pathways you use a lot get stronger, and your brain actually makes brand new brain cells, especially in the memory center. Brain scans show that learning new skills creates real physical changes in your brain at any age. London taxi drivers have bigger memory areas for memorizing all those street layouts, and it doesn't matter if they started driving cabs at 25 or 55. Your brain keeps adapting no matter how old you are. The bigger your brain, the smarter you are. Seems logical. Bigger animals often have bigger brains. So bigger must mean smarter, right? Wrong. A whale's brain is far bigger than ours, but humans outperform them in abstract reasoning and building smartphones. What matters isn't size, it's neural efficiency and organization. Intelligence correlates more strongly with cortical thickness, neural density, and the number of synaptic connections per neuron. Humans have about 86 billion neurons packed into our cortex, with each neuron connecting to thousands of others through approximately 100 trillion synapses. Our prefrontal cortex, the area responsible for executive functions like planning and abstract thinking, is proportionally much larger than other mammals. Additionally, we have more glial cells that support neural function and faster myelination that speeds signal transmission. Einstein's brain was actually 10% smaller than average, but post-mortem analysis showed he had more glial cells and denser neural connections in areas associated with mathematical and spatial reasoning. Multitasking works. You're probably multitasking right now, watching this video while scrolling comments, maybe answering texts, we love to think we're productivity machines juggling multiple tasks at once. But here's the truth. Your brain doesn't multitask, it task switches. When you think you're multitasking, your prefrontal cortex is rapidly switching attention between different tasks through a process called task switching. Each switch triggers what neuroscientists call a switching cost. Your brain needs time to disengage from one task, update its goals, and re-engage with the new task. This happens because of limited attentional resources controlled by networks like the frontoparietal attention system. Brain imaging shows that attempting to multitask creates bottlenecks in information processing, particularly in the anterior cingulate cortex, which monitors conflicts between competing demands. The result? You're slower overall and make more mistakes. You can drive and chew gum simultaneously because those are automatic processes controlled by different brain regions. But trying to consciously process two demanding cognitive tasks creates interference. Mozart makes you smarter. The Mozart effect 
became huge. In the 1990s, after one study suggested students who listened to Mozart scored slightly higher on a spatial reasoning test, parents rushed to buy classical music for their babies, thinking it would boost their IQs. Media went crazy with the idea. The original study by Rauscher and Shaw was actually quite limited. It involved just 36 college students, the effect lasted only 10 to 15 minutes, and it only improved one specific type of spatial temporal reasoning. Later, meta-analyses examining dozens of replication attempts found no consistent Mozart effect. What neuroscience research reveals is that music activates the brain's reward system, releasing dopamine and reducing cortisol levels, which can improve mood and focus, the real mechanism behind any temporary cognitive benefits. Brain imaging shows that listening to enjoyable music activates the default mode network and can enhance connectivity between brain regions. But there's nothing special about Mozart's composition specifically. Any music that improves your emotional state through familiar reward pathways might provide similar benefits. After childhood, you don't make new brain cells. For decades, scientists believed neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons, stopped once you hit adulthood. Your brain was basically fixed hardware that could only lose components over time. This dogma persisted until the 1990s when researchers finally had the tools to prove it wrong. Modern research using techniques like BAR-DU labeling and genetic markers has confirmed that certain parts of your brain, especially the hippocampus, continue producing new neurons throughout your life through a process called adult neurogenesis. These new neurons are born from neural stem cells in the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus and migrate to integrate into existing circuits. This process is linked to memory formation, learning, and mood regulation through mechanisms involving brain-derived neurotrophic factor, in short, BDNF. Exercise increases BDNF production and promotes neurogenesis, while chronic stress and sleep deprivation inhibit it. Studies show that rats in enriched environments, with running wheels, toys, and social interaction, can increase their hippocampal neurogenesis by up to 60%. Your brain isn't fixed hardware. It's constantly upgrading itself through new cell production and synaptic plasticity. Alcohol kills brain cells. You've probably heard this as a warning before a night out. Don't drink too much or you'll kill your brain cells. Sounds scary, but moderate drinking doesn't actually kill neurons directly. What alcohol does is more complex and arguably worse in some ways. Ethanol disrupts neurotransmitter balance, particularly affecting GABA and glutamate systems, which can impair synaptic plasticity your brains to strengthen connections between neurons. Chronic heavy drinking causes neuroinflammation and oxidative stress that damages dendrites and synapses, the delicate branches and connections that allow neurons to communicate. It also interferes with neurogenesis in the hippocampus and can cause brain tissue to shrink, particularly in the frontal lobe and hippocampus, regions crucial for executive function and memory. While neurons themselves might survive, their ability to connect and communicate becomes severely compromised. Brain imaging studies show that chronic alcoholics have reduced white matter integrity and decreased efficiency in neural networks. The damage is often reversible with sustained abstinence, as the brain can rebuild connections and even generate new cells, but it takes months to years of recovery. Left brain is logical, right brain is creative. You've heard people say they're left-brained because they're analytical, or right-brained because they're artistic. This idea is everywhere. Personality tests, career advice, even school programs designed around it. But it's pseudoscience. Both hemispheres of your brain work together constantly through the corpus callosum, a bridge of 200 million nerve fibers that allows instant communication between sides. While some functions do show hemispheric preferences, language processing tends to be left lateralized in about 95% of right-handed people, while spatial attention often shows right hemisphere dominance, these are subtle statistical tendencies, not absolute divisions. Brain imaging studies show that creative tasks like writing poetry activate networks across both hemispheres simultaneously, involving left hemisphere language areas, right hemisphere prosody, and imagery regions, and bilateral networks for executive control and memory retrieval. Mathematical reasoning similarly engages bilateral, prefrontal, parietal, and temporal regions. The left brain logical, right brain creative idea oversimplifies how neural networks actually function. Real cognitive abilities emerge from integrated activity across multiple brain regions and both hemispheres working in concert. We only use 10% of our brain. This is probably the most famous brain myth of all. The idea that 90% of your brain is just sitting there waiting to be unlocked like some superpower. 
Hollywood made entire movies about this. Take a magic pill and suddenly you're telekinetic. Modern neuroimaging techniques like fMRI, PET scans, and EEG show activity across the entire brain even during rest. When you're doing nothing, your brain activates what's called the default mode network, a system involving the medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and angular gyrus that's active during introspection and self-referential thinking. Different tasks light up different neural networks, the motor cortex when you move, the visual cortex when you see, the language networks when you speak or read. Your brain consumes about 20% of your body's total energy despite being only 2% of your weight. That's because all 86 billion neurons are constantly maintaining electrical potentials and firing signals. If 90% was really inactive, you wouldn't need nearly that much energy. Damage to even small brain regions causes noticeable deficits, proving every area has important functions. The myth likely originated from early neuroscience's incomplete understanding and got distorted through popular culture.